I'm going to um, pass it on to Dr. Miguel Gallardo, uh, who is a professor of psychology at Pepperdine University. He's also the research and evaluation um, and clinical director for MECA. My name is Ileana soto -Welty. I'm the executive director of MECA, and welcome to our um, writer's workshop series called These Are Our Stories. It's part of our Drawing Out Stigma program. So I'll pass it on to you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, Ileana. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see um, folks uh, here this evening. And, um, you know, I think in just, I'll just say something briefly about MECA. Uh, MECA is the multi-ethnic collaborative of community agencies. And, um, uh, you know, we, we sort of identified ourselves as a collective impact coalition um, working to eliminate uh, ethnic and racial disparities and improve the quality of life uh, for underserved multi-ethnic communities uh, here in, in Orange County. And, you know, and I think hopefully we, we have a, a, a reach that goes beyond that to a certain degree. But we came together, a um, bunch of agencies, and we've continued to build a, a, upon that. And, and so really all of our work and and tonight, I think you'll, you'll see this, um, it's really about trying to make sure that we're representing, um, you know, the, the diversity of the human experience and, and, and what that can look like and, and why that's important. And, uh, and so we're trying to make sure that's represented in our work. I also have a, a podcast that I, where I talk about a lot of these issues as well, and this will be actually on that podcast. Um, so it's gonna get a lot of airtime beyond just this evening. And, um, and so I'm excited about that because um, we have um, uh, Marcus Somari with us today. And um, I, I think, Ileana, you're gonna introduce Marcus, correct? Yeah, okay, I'll pass it back to you, Ileana. Okay. Yep. So before we get started, I wanted to thank the Orange County Healthcare Agency for making this webinar possible. It's part of our Drawing Out Stigma program, which is a program dedicated to reducing stigma and increasing the mental health awareness through the arts. And this, this year, we decided to use writing as sort of the vehicle for people to be able to talk about their feelings and emotions. And we had about over 350 participants, adults, youth, um, and older adults um, share their stories. And we have a collection of books as well that we're gonna be featuring on our website soon. And um, this program is, I think I froze there for a little, <laughs> little bit. Um, so we had Marcus work with our staff early on in the year and we wanted to welcome him back and do a workshop with all of you in the community. Um, and let me introduce Marcus. Marcus is a dedicated poet, writer, and performer. He has been a featured poet on Verses and Flow on TV One. He has authored several, several poetry chapbooks and contributed poetic vocals for various multi-genre music albums. Marcus teaches in the Creative Writing Conservatory at Orange County School of the Arts, co-directs the annual Boca de Oro Literary Festival, coordinates the Poetry Out Loud program, and heads the Rowdy Artistic Activist Collective Poetry Reform Party. So welcome, Marcus, and thank you for being part of this program. Marcus, you there? There you are. Hello, everybody. That was me coming on stage. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the grand entrance. I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Um, welcome, Marcus. Thanks for being here with us. Um, you know, we're, we're excited about the conversation uh, this evening and um, you know, looking forward to Mar Marcus is going to walk us through um, uh, a, a creative healing process that we can think about after we have a little bit of a conversation together. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, but you know, Marcus, to start our conversation, you know, I, I think it, it's hard not to because we're we're here to talk about um, you know how to how to destigmatize and you know um, all, all these these issues around us that, that, you know, that are really present at this moment in time. And that is, you know, our mental health and mental wellness. And um, with everything happening in the world right now, uh, I just wanted to get a sense from you, you know, um, how you're doing in the midst of, of these pandemics, if you want. I know we talked a, a little bit um, last week. You said you're off social media. You're like, I'm out. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, focusing on self-healing. And so, Maybe just give us a, you know, let us know where you're at and how you're doing and, 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 and sort of just that process for you. Um, <clears throat> wonderful question. I am at home. And I say, that, uh, I say that as a writer, as a pun, meaning 
um, not only am I home physically like everyone else in the midst of this pandemic, um, working from home, but um, the time has enabled me to find a sense of peace in a home within myself. So when I say I'm at home, it's another way of saying I'm at peace. Um, and it's almost a bit of foreshadowing to what we're going to deal with later on today as far as the, um, the writing is concerned. But yes, um, I uh, am a person who works in the arts um, and whose industry was uh, drastically uh, devastated like so many others um, in regards to the pandemic. Uh, most of the work I do is being physically present and teaching. Um, Ileana can speak to that. I believe my last physical in-person workshop <laughs> was for Mecca as our phones were blowing up saying six feet, six feet, six feet. <laughs> that, was the, that was the last day that we were allowed to be next to one another. And I remember by the, by the end of that workshop, by that afternoon, we all were like, so does this mean that we're all just six feet apart from here on out? And we never knew that that would be the case. <laughs> that would be the case for so many more months. Um, so that was the beginning of it. And since then, um, yeah, just finding different techniques to, to deal with the pandemic. One of the things I, I started to doing um, was working out. How about you? You get any working out in? I need to. <laughs> I've, you know, I've tried actually, but um, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, the one thing that's been interesting is that I, I feel like what's 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 come up a lot is, and I think this is true that we're working more now. I think in in some ways, or or we're trying to negotiate more now in some ways than maybe what, what we were doing before actually, and um, and so so trying to find the rhythm actually so, some weeks can be a little bit. Um, you know, interesting and, and challenging, but let um, me, can I jump in on something that you just sparked right there? Um, Cause that has a lot to do with, you know, my path over the last few months, which is originally um, I thought, okay, everyone's cast into this um, disarray. Uh, we're going to go full steam. We're going to dig into our work. Uh, we're going to be creative. We're going to be super creative. We're going to kind of find all these different ways to do these different things. And it was like <laughs> burnout quicker, <laughs> quicker than you could imagine. Yeah. Um, and I found that um, the path of healing for me was actually doing less, um, but more with intent. So the, the cliche is it's not a quantity, but quality. Is that what they say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually slowed down on the amount I was writing. I slowed down on the amount of workshops of course that I was doing and I said all right let's find a way to make this solitude um, a space of of healing and growth rather than absence and loneliness yeah yeah no I like that actually and, and you know one of the things I've been telling folks too throughout this process is you know it, it's really been a time of reflection because I, I, I've said this multiple times I've heard myself saying it multiple times to to myself and my own family but also to others around like you know, I hear a lot of people saying, like, we, we need to get back to, like, you know, the normal, what it was before, et cetera. And I say, you know, hey, it's a time maybe to reflect on what, what, we, what we maybe want to leave behind, actually, and, mm -hmm. and not continue to bring with us, at, you know, as we move forward in some way. And, and I think that's meaningful, too, in, in this process of really self-reflection and, and trying to be intentional about that. But, it, you know, um, it's, it's been a challenge. I think I, I, I read some studies recently that said, you know, there's been some research that's been done already through this time. And uh, they said, you know, stress and depression levels have increased dramatically for mm -hmm. folks. Uh, and then if you already had some, you were already dealing with something prior to this, this, this pandemic or these pandemics, if you will, um, uh, that it's even more salient for you at this moment in time. So whether you were dealing with it before or not, it's like, people are just moving through this process because it's really impacting, you know, how they're feeling, how they're doing, um, you know, and, and that's been tough. That's been tough. So I think centering on what we need to do to heal is important. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in on there because it, you touched on a little bit earlier. I'm going to bounce back when you say something about process. Um, the different ways that everyone processes was um, a major reason for me I'm um, stepping back off of social media. And when I say I step back off, off of social media for everyone here, um, I, I clipped and deleted um, all of my major social media 
um, which was alarming to a lot of people as an artist because they go, hey, your whole income is based off of relevance, is based off of being known, is based off of being out there and performing. How are you, <laughs> how are you going to survive by cutting all that down? I said, well, first of all, I can't go anywhere and do anything as far as, like I used to do. So let me not sweat the small stuff as far as that's concerned. No harm, no foul. That's already a lost thing. Um, but um, one day I was, I was going through scrolling like everyone else going through scrolling scrolling um and realized after five minutes after 10 minutes after 15 minutes i wasn't feeling any better right 30 minutes later not feeling any better at all um in fact many days i was feeling worse <laughs> and i wouldn't put down my phone until it had hit the point where i was like i don't want to feel bad anymore and then i put my phone down and I recognize this pattern of looking to social media during, again, um, as trying to find something to keep me a balance, keep me afloat, get some pick-me-ups, get some laughs, get some memes. But then I'd always hit a point where it'd come down like, all right, I'm off of this. Um, it happened during, um, and we'll get into this. Someone watch the time here because I'll, I'll take off in a story really quick. Um, but around the times of the, the murders of... Uh, uh, Floyd and um, Arbery mm -hmm. uh, and I was everyone was already at home but now everyone's at home with access to social media to access for their opinions to access to their thoughts not only was it a 24-hour news cycle everyone had 24 hours to be locked into that news cycle and then everyone had 24 hours to talk about the 24 hours of news cycle yeah. And it was too much for me. I tie that back to the word process because for some, that is the method for them. Rather than hold it in, let me express myself. Let me express my feelings. This is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling sad. This is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling angry. This is how I'm feeling. I want to make fun of something. This is how I'm feeling. I want to have others share in my misery. You know, I'm sad, everyone. Don't you feel sad for me? I mean, I recognize that, and this is, again, just speaking specifically on social media and my journey with that, um, that I was engaging um, thoughtlessly um, in a lot of unsolicited processes mm -hmm. um, and taking a part and being a part and being thrust into other people's processes of healing was not healing for myself. Um, someone who already felt at the forefront of what was going on with Arbery, you know, at the forefront of what was going on with George Floyd, I did not want to be placed somewhere where, again, just the opinions and feelings were bombarding. Even those that I would agree with, too much. <laughs> Even those that I would side with, yeah. too much. So that was my decision back in early May um, to really not even reduce, just started looking at the pictures that I cared about, saved some pictures, closed it up looked at a few things, you know, from years ago that I'd never looked at, you know, these scrolling down in messages, clip that. Look at Twitter. Oh my God, I haven't used Twitter in three years. You know, clip that. Um, and I freaked out. <laughs> I said, my God, I've gone from embracing isolation to loneliness. What am I going to do? I have no one to look at. I have no one to communicate with. Um, Miguel, but I, I discovered in that absence that, that that wasn't true. I was able to, um, what's the word, uh, uh, basically uh, find and extract, um, ah, the term is escaping me right now. Um, the fact that I was really locked in to that um, as, as something that was giving me something when it really, it really wasn't. So um wow that just completely you know flew away from me right there but um yeah as i as i as i freaked out um when i realized that time away the first three days um i thought wow no one's no one's reaching out to me that was the first thing the first thing was the checking of the ego i don't know if you ever recognize that where you go you call somebody and they don't call you back that's that small thing right oh, or you yeah. text someone yeah. and they don't text you back that's that small thing right <laughs> where Imagine you've been on Facebook, you've been on Twitter, you've been on Instagram for years, you talk to everyone, your friends list is long, and then you get rid of it all. 
I thought the world would come calling. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Uh, no one called. <laughs> no one called. No one texted. And the first wake up for me was everyone's dealing with this. Everyone's dealing with things. Everyone's processing. You led into it earlier. It's not just the pandemic. It's not just racism, right? I have a sick mother. People have sick parents. People passed away in the last six months unassociated with um, mm. the pandemic. People had birthdays. People had babies in the hospital, right? Yeah. Yeah. People still got married over Zoom. <laughs> I, had, I had become so absorbed in myself and the vision of others that once I took that step back in those first days off, I realized that, hey, this is a much bigger world with much bigger issues going on. Instead of being locked into what everyone else is feeling in this kind of group, you know, pain thing, let me start looking at the individual issues that affect um, and are most important to me. And to end this rant and, you know, have you jump back in, that's when I started, uh, of course, having conversations with my mom and dad more. Oh, my God, the argument I had with my dad was the breakthrough moment. Woo! Never would have happened without the pandemic, Right. Yeah. The three-hour conversation with my brother, the long conversations with friends. So in the end, the absence of social media meant that when I talked to people, the conversations went on longer and they went on deeper. And we actually had conversations about things that we had never really talked about because we were so used to communicating in bite-sized things that we just let things go on and on and on and on before all that was gone. I was like, Dad, let's talk, let's talk about that time where you made fun of me in grade school and da 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 You know, I'm still feeling that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Sorry for that long one. Oh, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there was so much there, actually, that you said um, that, that I think is so important. Um, it's interesting because I, I think about, like, you know, it's always – there's sort of a rhythm in there to a certain degree around, like, how do we – like, how do we – you know, it's like, do we – did you disconnect entirely from the process or, or, were, or were you still connected to it, but you just weren't letting it affect you in the way that it, it had before you sort of just said, I'm out, I'm, I'm done. Cause I'm, I'm interested because I think part of, part of why I'm asking the question is because I think there's something around, we, we talk a lot about this around, you know, the collect there's, there's a, there's a healing in the collective too. Right. Yep. And, and Certainly, uh, we, 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 there's a difference between being alone and then being lonely, feeling lonely. Like, we can, like, so, like, like, I'm cool being alone, but that doesn't mean I'm lonely, right? And, and I, I think there's a distinction there. But so I, I think it's that rhythm around, like, how do we, how do we get to the point where we're, we're focusing on ourselves and realizing that, that, you know, the world is much bigger than we are and yet also still remaining somewhat connected to the pain not because we want to be immersed and, 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 and bogged down by it, but also it's almost like seeing our connectedness and responsibility to each other as, as human beings. I think for me, that was a big part of it as well. Like, well, like what, what can I do to try to make this better for, you know, for, for others, for, for other, I mean, even this, this notion of wearing a mask, I think, you know, somehow or another put on a mask is, you know, sure, it's as much for me, but it's as much for the other people that are around me as well. And, yeah. and, and so, so I guess, like, does that make sense that, like, how, how do we stay connected, but also, because I think that's important. I think it's important to see our responsibility to one another to take care of each other a little bit, while also not, you know, being so immersed and so, and so, and so um, it, affected by it, that it, 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 it renders us sort of, immobile or, 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 or um, you know, overwhelmed in some ways, if that makes sense. I do. I, I wrote down one word. Um, actually, a few words. Let me not lie. Uh, <laughs> clarity. Um, you've heard uh, the very cliche definition of insanity before, right? It's the, the idea of doing something over and over, expecting different results, right? Yeah, right. Something like that, paraphrase. Yeah, yeah um, that's how I felt when it came to social media. Um, I felt like I had been doing a lot for years, gaining traction, brand, brand yourself, you know, this many posts today, this many pictures, you know, then the guilt settles in. Oh, you know, someone posted a picture of their baby. Let me make sure I like that. Cause if I scroll past that, 
then I got to sit with that the rest of the day. They're going to call me out on it, right? It became a responsibility to a non-living thing. It became a responsibility to all these imagined uh, connections um, that were, were real in the sense that I knew the people, but they weren't as visceral and, and, and personally uh, affecting as I thought they were. And that's why I said the first three days, no one called me. Now, a week later, of course, people started to get in touch with me. But when I, the word clarity came to mind because um, stepping back from being everywhere with everyone, sharing opinions and listening to everyone's opinions, when you sit with yourself, and I'll give another word, you said uh, there's a difference between being alone and loneliness. I always try to take, you know, the association word out of it. There's a difference between um, solitude and loneliness, right? The, the solitude is, there's that choice, you know, I've chosen to be here. Now, um, what do I do with that? I believe it's uh, Rene Maria Wilkie, he, uh, a famous a writer, one of my favorite poets, wrote letters to a young poet, and he talked about how when we can go inside and embrace our solitude is where we really find our creativity. Mm -hmm. um, the, was it the, the writer into the, not into the wilderness, but just wrote about on Walden Pond or something like that, right? There's so many examples for writers as we transition talking about that, yeah. that talk about, hey, they're embracing that time, whether it be nature or at home or by the lake, um, to do something with it. So when the word clarity comes to me, it just means that all the noise shut down. And what I was left with, with were my own thoughts, transitioning to the next point you were making, which is shared responsibility or shared thought. Um, I realized that a lot of my thought was becoming clouded, um, trying to adjust to the opinions of others that were coming every second, right? One minute I thought I knew this, then the next minute I thought I knew this, then someone else had this to say, and I'm jacking, jumping back and forth. Okay, I know this, I know this, I agree, I agree. Okay, no, I don't agree, blah, blah. Once all that ceased, I was able to go back within what I knew of myself up to that particular point and find clarity in how I felt about what was happening in the world, what was happening with my friends, what was happening to myself without noise, and I call it noise, without the social noise every five minutes, every 30 minutes, every two hours, I was not realizing how what I was going to um, as a way to keep afloat was actually a barrier to me making my own decisions and choices. And it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm out here some rebel or maverick or something like that. Um, but it goes to that decision of what do I want to do? How do I want to be a part of the change that's taking place, whether it be with the protests, whether it be with the mask and political, whether it be with the, the students I'm teaching, or the next workshop I'm doing, how can I make a difference? And actually having that time away and being challenged um, to fill that time with new creative ideas uninformed by others, it did pose some clarity. And I came away, um, first of all, reading books uh, that had been sitting up there forever. And the books I read were books that were um, suggested to me years ago. Um, and again, just having that constant, it was, oh, thank you. You know, I'll get to it. Oh, thank you. I'll get to it. Um, but in the last few months, I've knocked out three books, three very powerful books. Uh, one by Bell Hooks called All yeah. About Love. Awesome. Awesome. Love Bell right. Hooks. The Bell Hooks, All About Love. I'm also on her, another book of hers called Black Salvation. Um, I went to a book called uh, The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown. Oh, um, great. That, that was a now watch that. That was a book suggested to me by an ex-girlfriend. And I read it like, could I have saved that relationship? <laughs> Again, you if know only, what to... If only I read it back then. <laughs> if only I read it when she said, you should read this. Um, you, we know what we know when we know it. Yeah. Um, and then just some rereading of Kihil Gibran and um, Khalil Gibran and some James Baldwin. But that's what I mean by the absence of social media allowed for a clarity of perspective where I could really lay out the ideas of how I wanted to re-enter the fray, yeah. if you will. So now I'm quite comfortable having different conversations with people because I, know, I feel comfortable with what I think and what I feel. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's reminding me, Marcus, of, of, have you heard of the NAP ministry by any chance? No, I have not. Oh, yeah, I won't. I won't uh, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, actually, because 
she talks about rest as being sort of part of liberation and, and the idea that we need to sort of slow down, we need to sort of take a breath, we need to nap, we need to rest. And that actually is part of how we, you know, we, we do what you just did really in many ways. Like we were able to sort of re-enter with more clarity, with, with, with being more centered maybe, et cetera. It's, um, I think she's on Instagram. It's at, at the NAP ministry, NAP ministry. Um, very, very, really good stuff. But it's really around this notion of like, you know, we need to slow down more actually. And, and that that actually might be the, the avenue to liberation for, for ourselves and, and for whatever might be happening around us in some way. So Is that NAT like the acronym NAT, N-A-T, or is that NAT like short for Natalie? No, N-A-P, like NAP. Nap. Oh. NAP, NAP ministry. Even better. At, you know, actually preparing and thought for um, coming on and speaking today, uh, just like, what have I done? What am I doing? Um, and I knew it was going to be, of course, centered around writing. And I go, as a writer, what do I do if the things that are helping me don't deal with writing? Um, <laughs> how, how do I, how do I excuse my poor behavior? Um, it's this. Um, again, where there's that connection where as a writer, I have, and many have, that outlet of expression, um, that conduit to get out their emotions. But also, being a writer doesn't separate me from the other processes that are just as healing. It, talk about a nap. So that's something else that if we're home all day, I would take naps and I'd feel guilty about the naps. I'd feel lazy. I'd feel useless. I'd wake up and I'd bemoan all the productivity that could have been had, you know, had I not napped, <laughs> right? Talk about the separation in terms of terms and intention. Um, so I started scheduling the naps. Basically, um, there'd be a nap for 26 minutes. I can't tell you where I got the 26 minutes from. Some <laughs> article talked about that. If, was the if it works, it works. <laughs> the, perfect, the perfect time for the perfect timing for a power nap is you set it for 26 minutes. It gives you enough time to kind of fall asleep and then wake up and then four minutes to be about it. <laughs> um, but now knowing, hey, each day or on this particular day, I'm going to take a nap at this time. There was no guilt associated with that time associated with napping. I knew, going, I, knew I wanted to accomplish these things before. I knew I'd get some rest. And when I woke up, I was like, great. I took that nap because there was other stuff that I wanted to be alert as I was accomplishing. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with writing, but it does inform um, the fact that I wasn't always the type of person who could read. I'd fall asleep as I was reading, right? Now I'd come back from my nap, I'd do some work, and now I can read an hour, hour and a half, no problem, right? Alert like that. Also, there's clarity in terms of when I sit down and I start writing and thinking about different poems that I want to do. So yeah. napping is powerful. Yeah. So I, I want to ask one more question and then I want to transition to your, your, your writing workshop or writing exercise you're going to do with us. But you, you mentioned, um, you know, the books you're reading, you mentioned Bell Hooks, you know, you mentioned Black Salvation, you mentioned you know, the deaths of George Floyd and uh, uh, Aubrey, um, uh, you know, and, and these other folks. And, and you're from, you're from Wisconsin. You're from, I, I think, Racine, Wisconsin. Is that correct? Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, I'm right. Uh, we're, we're from Racine, Wisconsin. And close to Kenosha, uh, where there's uh, a lot of stuff happening. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, how, as you, as you were in this process, you know, um, I would imagine that it's 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 been hard. You know, I'll, I'll speak personally. It's been hard and and painful to see the 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 what's happening in the world right now, and and what's and you know the, that's why I said these pandemics, this racism pandemic as well. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, um, maybe how have you moved through that in, in in essence through this process? Maybe maybe it's partly what you were already doing, and it just sort of was part of that process. But I just want to give you an opportunity. To maybe respond to that or give us and, and uh, about you know sort of how you negotiated that how you feel about that where you are with that um to use a, an abstract noun which we'll get into in a few minutes yeah. uh guilt was something that i dealt with um and i know a lot of people listening can can probably feel the connection with this um when you feel depended on um 
by those around you. Some of us are caretakers. Some of us, you know, all of us are somebody's mother, brother, sister, something like that. Um, so there's a, through that connectivity, you feel that others have a dependence. Um, some very real and physical, others more like myself, um, imagined in a sense, as far as social media is concerned. Um, but when I began that selective, selective is key. I didn't get, you know, distance myself from every, that selective and intentional distancing um, for the purposes of clarity. Um, one of the feelings that I felt with was I'm not around when people need me. Mm. Um, this is the time where everything I've, you know, read all the bell hooks, all the James Baldwin, all the Langston Hughes, all the miseducation of the Negro, this entire, this entire process of becoming a young black man who's, you know, educated and intentional and aware and woke. Um, and now your voice is not out there. Mm. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and then also just thinking, who, who, who needs me? Who, who's depending on my voice or who's depending on my connection? Um, I struggled with that separation type of thing. Um, and the way I came around with that is by checking in with people and really supporting other voices. Um, I recognized that I had always either been thrust into a position of leadership um, or chosen to be at the forefront. Um, but this gave me an opportunity to say, if my voice is not out there, if I'm not intentionally throwing out my opinion, who else is out there that's new and fresh and that I can support? I found myself um, being asked to host and participate in some protests that were putting on by youth, by teens and high schoolers, right? Wow, you mean I'm not the one who's running this thing? I don't have to, I'm just here in support and whatever resources? Exactly. Another friend of mine had an idea for something that he wanted to do in his school up in a Northern LA, called me, just sharing resources, of course. So the way I wrestled and released myself with the guilt is saying, me not being in the lead or not thrusting out my voice does not mean I can't be in support and be a part of things. Um, it just means that I'm intentional about my self-healing as much as I'm intentional, about, intentional with my participation. Yeah. So don't think that my absence is somehow a, a conceit to, hey, if the world burns down, let it burn down. No, I'm here. I'm watching. I'm listening. Hey, what do you need? What can I do? All right. You know what? Um, you should give the, the, someone that I usually work with directly. I'd say, hey, you should give this person a call. They've been you know, waiting on someone like you. Da, 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 da. They can help you out. They'll give you work resources. And watching this transition, I don't want to say transition of power, but watching a transition and a growth um, around me and hearing these voices made me think, all right, wonderful. When I come back um, into the fray um, and participate more in terms of my opinion with a lot of things that are going on, um, I feel a strength in a, in a brand new community um, around me, which is actually a chapter in Bell Hook's book, All About Love. It talks about communal love. And that was one of the grand awakenings I had, which was separating myself somewhat from the community actually allowed me to understand my workings within that, whether it be within the nuclear family, whether it been within the friendship, and then within the greater community of Black people and Americans, what I have to say, what I represent. Now I know what I can do. And I went back in doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, I think that that piece around, um, um, you know, the, the idea of, I think sometimes we get in this space where it's like, you know, we think we're the only ones who can do X, Y, and Z to a certain degree or what, you know, because we're so used to doing it or, yeah. or maybe not the only ones that can do it, but, you know, like we, we need to be there. But I think in, in some ways, actually, I think what you're saying, and I think this is so important is that when we're able to sort of step back or, 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 or you know, uh, uh, take a break or, or you know, uh, whatever it might be, whatever, that, however they might look, we're actually opening the space and, and creating space for more people to actually come in and, and, and join the collective in, in essence. So when you re-engage in whatever, not that you were disengaged, but when you go back into the process Wonderful. in yeah. a way that looked maybe somewhat like it did, you know, before or whatever that means, 
you're going to have other other folks with you at that moment in time. And how powerful is that? I mean, I think that's true for all of us in, in many ways. I think it, it, we 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 need the collective. We we need to 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 invite people, create the space for people to um, you know, to move into the into that into that that healing space, that active space, whatever it may be. So yeah, that's that's you, great. And I know we have to move on, but you hit a key word on there as far as me, which is balance. The balance between what we feel we need to do as individuals and what we may mean to the collective. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll speak this really quickly um, because I, I'm thinking of a friend who called me up and was like, Marcus, what can I do? What can I do? You know, I'm reading White Fragility. What can I do? <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> I'm like, I've known you for 20 years and now you're calling me asking what, can you, can, what you can do. Right. Um, <laughs> and my answer, which I credit to my distance from unsolicited opinions because it, came more, it became more clear to me, I said, you don't have to do anything. You're, what you may want to examine is what resources you have that you can open up. I was like, sometimes we get so locked in, we have to do, we have to be the one, you have to be. Sometimes you don't have to be the one. You wanna balance between being actions that you can take to move the world forward and then sometimes not having to be that action-oriented person, but to simply provide the resources for someone else to do that. And I said, listen, this 19-year-old has a lot more energy right now than I have. You know what I'm saying? At 19, they, you know, there is no, they're, they're still in their immortality phase. Right, right. I'm, I'm taking care of a sick parent. I'm feeling mortality. So I'm like self-help, self-healing, all this stuff, right? What do you need? Let me turn over my resources you knock down this wall. And once I saw them knock down that wall, I said, my God, I've been inspired. Let me get back in there and re-engage. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool, very cool. That's awesome, Marcus. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition over to, to, to you a, a little bit more intensely around the, as a writer, you know, um, what are some ways, um, you know, you, you have maybe, you know, kind of how you can lead us in a discussion, exploring ways for, personal creative writing that can really help us kind of do some of the things that you were talking about. And, um, you know, maybe you can share some of your experiences and, and kind of guide us in this process of how we can, can, can do that. Yeah, here we go. The, okay. guide, <laughs> the guide portion of it. Um, there is a, a, a very true and real term um, that's a part of the artistic community. I don't know how much of it's part of so many other communities but the feeling of the imposter syndrome. I was telling a friend the other day, even teaching, I'll teach and I'll have to grade some papers and I'll go, who am I to grade this? <laughs> who am I? I remember being 14 and being you. Now I'm grading, telling you what to do. Um, I use that to speak saying, even, even as we lead into a, a workshop and a writing um, exercise, that I come to it very humbly. Um, I come to it with an awareness that my background, um, my experiences, my expertise, if you will, um, place me um, in, a, in, a, in a position of service um, where I can help others, um, yet I don't have to feel as if I'm the leader in a sense. Um, so I want to guide you very much as a participant um, as well. Uh, so as a writer, one of the things that I've been doing um, as I expressed before, is finding um, distance um, and understanding what the power in intentional uh, solitude and isolation. So in the morning I get up uh, and I space myself out. I mean, I'll grab a banana, I'll grab some water and I'll go for a walk. I'll find just some space out there. Um, I'll, I'll listen to books on tape, <laughs> which I was not really big on doing before. Um, and then I come back and I settle into what I want to do for the day. Um, some of the writing exercises that I've done with my students and done with other workshops um, help because they lean into what I'm going through. Um, what I love about um, The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown is she talks about dealing with um, shame and fear um, and one of the ways that I overcame that was to discuss those things through my writing um, in bits and pieces. So we're gonna do 
not something that deals with shame and fear, so to speak. I'm just kind of mentioning that because that's the, the pretext of the book. Um, but how we can pick away at thoughts and, and memories and experiences um, that have really lifted us in life and find those places to keep us afloat um, that have really replaced social media for me. So it's find what are the social and, community of, and communal things that I've collected over time um, that I can really lean on and create from rather just absorbing it from other people. So um, as I'm running this, I, let me just make sure I understand this. No, we don't have an audience on screen, so I'll be leading this and everyone's just kind of listening, right? Yeah, you, you can, we can let people come on if you want them to. It's your, it's, it's, you, you do what you do. So you tell us, and we, we told folks that they could come on, you know, at, at Q&A, but if you want them to come on now, it's cool. We got about, we got about 20 folks on, so it's a nice group. Um, you, however you want to run it, it's all well, good. Perfect. Um, let me give these, these are going to be very simple instructions. And what I'm going to do is I do, you do a workshop, you do a mini workshop. This is more or less a micro workshop. So this is the very nuanced tip of the iceberg to get you going. If there's anyone in, out there who is, um, has their hair done um, and feels comfortable um, on what's the, what's the thing? Sharing a video, it, it allows me to kind of see faces. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say that if you want to undo your, your videos, so be it right now, I'm just looking at a black screen, which makes it a little awkward. It's just me and Miguel right now. Yeah. <laughs> so it feels like I'm just running the workshop with you, but we'll work with that. Um, the other instruction is this. If you have a piece of paper near you, I'm sorry, we should have said this right in the beginning. Um, you're going to need to grab that. So I'll jibber jabber for another 30 to 60 seconds. If you have a notepad or um, maybe a bill that, you're like, I'll get that next week, and it's blank on the back. All you need is an eight and a half by 11 right there. Hey, I see you. Uh, thank you for undoing your screen. Um, all you need is eight and a half by 11 right there. Something really simple. Um, so one of the things that um, we know is that finding our own voice, raising your voice, raising your vibration. Hey, I see another person. Wow. Okay. Now we see some faces. Whoa. Wow. Talk about mental health going through the roof. Oh my God. There's an audience. <laughs> it was so strange. Now it changes that. Look at me. Can you tell that I'm a performer starved for an audience? It's a completely different personality now. Now I'm on. Great. Um, so, Raise your voice. Oh my God, my life is changing with every face that pops up. Um, raise your voice, raise your vibration, right? When we talk about raising our voice and raising our vibration, one of the things that we can realize is that our, vo our voice often comes from our beginnings, right? Where we find truth is buried there as well. Um, I know sometimes in life we want to go on, leave the past in the past. Um, <laughs> but our voice, where we first started speaking, are in those early moments. And we don't want to ignore the fact that that has something to play, a very large piece into who we are. Um, so let's take a trip back, if you will, um, back home, right? Um, everyone, if you will, Sit back, get your shoulders back really quick, right? Do your neck, do your neck, get your shoulders, relax, relax, relax. It's a, it's a micro workshop, so we're not going to go through a whole breathing routine, but I do want you to kind of get the cracks out and get a deep breath in there, right? One more time, let's take a deep breath together. Everyone on three, one, two, and... And then let it out slowly. All right, quickly, there we go. We don't have time for four more breaths, so hopefully that one breath did you good. Um, I want you to think about home. Miguel asked me a question earlier. He says, um, it crumbs, but my answer was, I feel very much at home, not only physically, but inside myself as well. I want you to take me back by your mind to your childhood home, whether it be your neighborhood, whether it be your favorite room in your house, whether it be your home in general, could be your aunt's home, could be your grandmother's home. Take me back to a home 
where you're like, ah, now this, this is home, right? Sometimes for me, when I think of home, I think of Concord Drive in Racine, Wisconsin. But most often, awkwardly, when I think of home, I always think of myself at my grandmother's house. <laughs> when someone says start writing about home, all of a sudden I'm writing as if I was born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. I throw that out there because I just want you to think about home and then what comes to mind, right? You're someone else's, but a place that you've experienced. Um, I want to talk about the senses and what they mean. Um, I know I don't want to take everyone off a of mute right now because that'd be too much. So typically I'd ask and we'd interact and engage through this workshop. So work with me. So you're like, man, this guy's talking a lot. It's because I'm talking over all the things that I usually ask your opinion on, but I'm just going to give it to you. I'm just going to assume you guys are all geniuses and that you answer these things correctly. So my first question is, could someone, anyone give me five senses, right? Well, I see all your hands going up. So let me give them to you right now. Your five senses are these, and you want to write these down just in case you want to remember them. I know you all knew them, but just in case you want to remember them, right? Your five senses are taste. Your other one is smell. Miguel, I saw you knew that one already. Your hand went up. Um, sight, because you all are looking at my tatted hair right now. Where are we? What did I say so far? Missing touch. Touch, right? And there you go. I see you, Jane. Sound. I heard a dog in the background somewhere. <laughs> All right. So we have our five senses. I want you to think of home in terms of five senses. Take a moment and I want you to think of your favorite experience in that home or as a place of home, right? There you go, I see that smile over there. I see someone smiling right now. If you gotta close your eyes, close it. We're not here to excavate too much of the deep things. I want to stick to some highlights, some favorite memories. Maybe it was the time you uh, froze Kool-Aid in the freezer and then tried to sell it outside and it melted before you could get 25 cents for it, you know what I'm saying? Maybe it was the time where your favorite memory of home is, you know, helping your grandfather pull out the hose and water the garden. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. I'm throwing out all these random things. Um, maybe it's, you know, just journaling, you know, in, in sixth grade and you couldn't wait to get back and write about unicorns. I don't know, right? But I want you to think about a favorite experience um, <laughs> in that house. Maybe it was Christmas. Maybe it was Hanukkah. Maybe it was a birthday. Maybe it was the time someone tripped and fell first first in the cake. Um, and I want you to start collecting words associated with taste, right? I want you to get at least five words written down that taste is a sense that you can associate with that memory, all right? I'll give you a few seconds <laughs> as I write my senses down over here so I don't forget them. And we gotta move quick, this is a micro workshop. So if you don't get five, that's fine. But just think in terms of your experience. Think deep, say, hey, was I chewing gum at the time? Say, hey, was it a dusty room that I was in? Does it taste dusty? Whatever you can think in terms of taste, right? Let's move to the next sense, right? Think of that experience. Think of that home. Think of that environment. Now, give me five words that deal with smell. What does it smell right, right? Do you smell uh, 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 the city bus that always passed by, right? Do you smell the exhaust from the person next door, you know, fixing their car? Do you smell cornbread in the kitchen? right? Do you smell uh, your brother's stinky uh, jersey? <laughs> Hockey jersey or something ridiculous like that. Um, do you smell, your, do you smell um, maybe your mom's perfume that she's been wearing for all your life <laughs> and gets as a gift every Christmas? The same perfume. Five words with smell. All right, let's move on. Sight, okay. Everyone goes to sight first. Now, what are you seeing? 
five words that you can see. What are the first things that kind of pop out to you? When I say highlights, right? Not asking for sentences. You can see something really simple. A smell, sight, touch, sound. Sight should have been really easy. The, other, the next one is touch. Oh, now, this is when you got to sit back and think, all right, what is it that I'm feeling? Were you in a chair? Were you in a couch with your legs on the plastic? Like my aunt kept her red couch in plastic. <laughs> and I kept that house at 82 degrees. Um, are you feel, listen, are you feeling, are you in your uncle's favorite rocking chair? Um, do you feel yourself laying on the grass, right? Oh my God, the feel of prickly grass around me. What are some things that you can touch? Are you wrapped in the blanket? Is your head on a pillow? There's a million things that we touch and we sense all the time, but we don't give consideration to what it is that we're touching and what's feeling us, right? The last one is sound, all right? Closing your eyes, taking that breath and thinking when things get quiet, and this is where I got to get quiet and leave you with this. What are the sounds associated with that experience, with that feeling, with that memory? What do you hear in your room? What can be heard in your room? What do you hear outside? What can be heard down the street? Who's talking in the next room, right? Who's talking to you? <laughs> Maybe someone's, someone's, you know, praising you for something. Um, Maybe one of your favorite memories, like, like me, I remember sitting downstairs and just holding my dog. I remember one day I came home from school and just chilled with my dog for like 20 minutes. And you know how dogs sound when they're all in your ear, right? Think about all those nuanced sounds that we collect every day. Perfect, all right, let me check my time really quick. All right, here we go. <sighs> At this particular point, <laughs> I'd say, let's start talking about these experiences, right? I choose somebody, I choose a sense, and I'd say, all right, you know, Someone talk to me about taste. What's something that we can taste from your experience? And they'll throw out a few words associated with taste. And someone else would, may try to guess what's going on in the experience. And they'll just say, no, actually, this is the memory that I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, right? And then someone will say sound. They'll list out some sounds. And someone says, oh, this makes me think of X, Y, and Z. And then they'll reveal what that sound is associated with, right? So it's that opportunity to kind of share in our senses and then our collection of experiences, which is really a beautiful thing once we go, wow. Once you hear all the different things, you go, man, not only have I shared in those experiences, but some of those I've never even encountered in my life. And now I know what that think, that sound smells or tastes like. Um, you're gonna need two sides of a piece of paper. You got your piece of paper here? Right, it's gonna, it's going to be two halves, one here and one here. The first one here is going to be your nouns. We're not gonna get deep into English. I do not have a PhD in English. Nouns for everyone who's like myself <laughs> is a person, place, or thing. So I want you to just list off people, places, or things, objects associated with your memory, with your experience. Just go. Do not, do not block yourself. Don't overthink nouns. Is this a noun? Is it not a noun? Person, place, or thing, right? Just go. Just go. There's no English quiz after here. There's no degree. A person, place, or thing associated with the memory. See if you can reach about 10 of them. Check my time on that. Eliana's screen is off, so she must be really deep into this workshop. Miguel, I see you smiling, but I also want to see you typing. I am. All right. 
am. I am. Okay, perfect. All right, I'll give you, what do we need? We need another 15, 20 seconds just now. People, places, and things. And maybe, and listen, and when I, again, as a writer, I got to go. Sometimes we get attached to the people in front of us. Are there people around us? That's why I say, is there someone in the next room? Is there someone down the hall? Is there someone, you know, across the street? What are the things surrounding that experience of that memory? People, places, and things. Part of being a writer is really exploring all those things. We got nouns. All right, perfect. On the next side of it, I want you to write here, and this is where I have to play around with a shared screen here. <laughs> um, abstract nouns. Actually, I want to deal with dangling participles. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're gonna deal with abstract. You guys laugh like, oh God, no, please. Um, abstract nouns um and if someone is able i can share my screen right now right i think so i think so give it a shot Try, yeah Perfect. so i'm going to share my screen and i'm just going to run through and i'm going to throw out some words so i want you on the right side or on the other side of the page to just write out abstract um nouns that come to mind um and before i share the screen i'm going to just start throwing out some Abstract nouns would be <clears throat> things like disbelief or fear or freedom or love um, or honor. Thank you as I figure out how to share my screen. There we go. <laughs> so we have disbelief, faith, fragility. What are the things that jump out to you that really these words kind of associate it with you? You go, man, you know, fragility, uh, adoration, beauty, um, chaos. Hope is a good one. Joy, um, liberty, loss. I oh, want some other ones there. Pain, peace, pleasure, defeat. I felt defeated sometimes. Talent, success, victory is an abstract noun. Wisdom, warmth, love, power. Those are all examples. And I've listed off about 10. So I've, you've I've really cheated. Usually I let people stress trying to come up with um, abstract nouns. But again, micro workshops, so I'm going to give them all to you. Usually I laugh and watch people struggle with, you know, going back to English class, but we don't have time for that. All right. So now we have a list of nouns on one side and we have a list of abstract nouns on the other. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of where your words are on there, I want you between, between the... Well, I'm just going to write word here and word here. So if you have a word on this side of the page and you have a word on this side of the page, in the middle, I want you to write the word of randomly. So it could be shoe of love. It could be aunt of hope, right? I want you to play around with the association. Exactly. I see someone smiling right now like, that's a dumb combination, right? This is the way it works. <laughs> Don't try to be poets right now. If you're looking at your list and you're trying to be a writer and a poet, you're going to mess up this experience because <laughs> this, this is where we find the writing. So regardless of where the words show up, I just want you to write of in the middle, right? It could, I don't know, I'm trying to think of nouns right now. It could be uh, uh, Miguel of Honor. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, all those things. I want the noun. It could be the pillow of faith, whatever it is in there. Um, great. So we have our list. We have our of. We have our words there. So this is how we tie these things together. And let me try to make sense of this really quickly. Um, when we're dealing with ourselves as writers and as people, one of the first things I help people do um, through a writing exercise is just go back to the basics. When we're talking about writing, we're talking about how to go through a pandemic, dealing with all the things that we're experiences. I say, let's talk about the basics of experience. How do we experience the senses? Taste, touch, smell, boom, boom. All right, well, let's list off the things that we are experiencing. Let's list off those things. But rather than deal with pandemic experience, right? Let's go back to a favorite place experience, right? Let's start off with something like, okay? 
And then I want people to understand as writers and as communicators that those things that you have, those five things that you have in common, you most often have in common with everyone else in the world. So you say, how is something that I'm writing going to be so personal that someone else will care about? Why? Well, if you talk, you're talking about something that can be tasted, that means that someone can taste that. They can relate to that. If you're talking about a sound that can be heard, if they've never heard it, they can imagine it or they can look it up, right? So what you're dealing with is you're taking your own personal experiences from your favorite idea or place of home and you're connecting it to a sense that someone else shares with you. Therein you have your isolated intentional space and distance. You write and you create a list of things that you go through and are experiencing. And then by focusing on the five senses, this sounds so simple, but when you, you wonder why these writers are published the way they are, look back at the writing, what they're really targeting is all the senses that you have in common with them. Then you start looking at, okay, I can see that, I can smell that, I can taste that. Now what's the next link in there? That next link is, what is that abstract feeling that may be lingering out there that I can tie it to that we have in common? Is it hope? Is it faith? Is it loss? Is it love? Is it bravery? Is it courage? Is it fear? Is it shame? And here, we may talk bravery and pleasure and then think that's different from fear and shame. But as Brene Brown says, and as also as James Baldwin says, the pain and blood we spill in our experiences, if we can't find a way as writers to translate that into a place that connects with others, then we've lost our way. As an artist, it's incumbent upon us to take these experiences and tie them to other people. So you have your personal experience, you have your sense that people can connect to, and then you have your lofty ideal, right? So now you have your shoe of loyalty or <laughs> something like that, right? Now your free right would be, tell me about when you think about that, this is a difficult challenge. When you go back into that experience in your house, when you, that, when, if someone were to bring that shoe to mind or that sound to mind or that taste to mind, what abstract noun comes to mind? If you're struggling with coming, well, coming one with like loyalty, I think of loyalty, I think of bravery, I think of pleasure, I think of loss. If you're struggling, then you choose one randomly and think, how can I tie these together with an experience and just have fun with it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you want to do is very, in, well, people go into it very intentional and they go, man, I have to go, you know, a, a water cup of bravery. And that's, and that's what they write and they get blogged down on trying to make it be some amazing experience. I do this exercise that may seem like it's pulled from all over the place because what I want people to understand is that it, it, it starts with your experience. It goes into the senses. It goes into a loftier connection. And then by challenging yourself to make those connections, that's when you start freeing yourself to experiences where you unlock writer's block, right? People say, I'm blocked on something. Don't be blocked. Have fun. Challenge yourself into finding that connection. Some come naturally, Others go, eh, it feels awkward, but let's have fun with it. I use this as a playful exercise and probably one of the, the beginning work sites, workshops I do because I don't want people to get locked down and trying to, trying to write something perfect. When we're in this pandemic, when we're going through systemic racism, when we're dealing with you know, ailing parents, when we're dealing with just trying to get food on our table, you know, shout out EDD, um, sometimes we just need to be creative. Sometimes we just need to sit down and write. And that's what I wanted you guys to get the beginning of, that you can get things written. And not only can you get things written, what you write can be a point of connection for other people. You just have to continue to explore that. So I know you all have thought about home. I know you all have smiled and thought about the senses that you have at home. I know you all have thought about some abstract nouns that everyone had, has thought about in terms of a concept. Now, you can roll on with that. My challenge to you after this workshop and talk as we're wrapping up is to spend 10 to 15 minutes and just finish writing about that experience. 
If you know what a simile is, use a simile. If you know what a metaphor, you know, like or as. If you know what a metaphor is with no like or as, use that. Don't get bogged down in being poetic. I want you to free yourself in order just to write it out. You will find that it gives you a space to just breathe as you get it out. And then you may look at it and go, this is actually pretty good. I either want to share this with someone or I wonder if this is something that someone else can grow from. So quick micro session. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Very cool. Very cool. I love it. You can love see it. the sun's going down where I'm yeah, sitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I really also appreciate it because I think it also, this idea of going home and, um, you know, it's like going to that place that, you know, that we can be grounded in, in many ways and in the midst of all the chaos and, 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 and the challenges and, and what we're experiencing as well. I know, Marcus, we, uh, we wanted to, I think you're going to share a poem um, uh, before we open it up for maybe Q&A. Can you? All right. Um, I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to shut off the light behind me to see if that helps in front of me. Is that okay? okay that's sure, 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 sure. And I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that um, if you wanted to submit your story, we have a website that we're developing called These Are Our Stories. And um, the link for that is ocmecca.org backslash submit. It's in the chat. Um, and you can submit your poems, your poetry, um, especially, you know, we've all been home during this pandemic. And what has that been like for you? Um, so... Marcus helped us uh, through a process to help us uh, share our story and we'd love for you to submit it. Uh, we'll be releasing and opening that up in October. So um, we'll be sharing that with a, a lot of folks here in Orange County, as well as the books that our agencies created. And also there's also a survey link here. Um, let us know what you thought about the workshop before you leave um, and um, Marcus, do you want to take it away? Sure. So um, here's a poem. Um, it's called On My Block. And I want you to think about the micro exercise that we did um, as I share this as well. Sorry, I did a lot of moving around, so hopefully my audio is still good. Still good, Miguel? Perfect. <clears throat> On My Block... Old lady fuchsia house dress, nicotine stained slippers, don't come out for nothing but to water her lawn. She creaks down daily just for to be dragging that bright industrial yellow sprinkler to the west side of her rusty real estate, just wishing on some growth back by that tattered old wood fence. Only things seem to sprout out by morning, be most cigarette butts. See, 14-year-old daughter got herself a 19-year-old boy fiend liking to bring her Marlboros and Kiwi Mad Dog round about midnight when grandmama be sleeping, mama be on the phone with new man who got a Cadillac and one of them good jobs down at the auto plant. Every early Saturday morning, old lady fuchsia house dress, nicotine stained slippers, slobs Olympic prayers that hurtle like gale over plates of eggs and grits and bacon and sausage and toast, blackened toast, prayers that hurtle over that old wooden fence and come crawling up into our yard while my father be out on the front porch rocking the morning paper to sleep. Prayers for her grandchild's safety, for her daughter's happiness, health for her own self, and for them chillin' to stay the hell up out of her pecan tree. See, my father been mentioning more often lately how he finna go back there, plank up a new fence, low enough to the ground for to keep the dogs in, but high enough for to keep old lady fuchsia prayers on her side of the world. See, my father say he got his own home full of hope and worry to be dealing with and got no time for silly prayers. I think it's cause that sprinkler be wearing on my daddy's shed, you know, wearing on the paint. And I know for a fact that my father hates the smell of blackened toast and prayers in the morning. That's it. 
So that okay. is, that's a poem um, that really relies on all my personal experiences um, down south around my grandmother's house in that neighborhood, just sensory overload and how that connects to the different feelings I've, ex I've felt growing up, you know, whether it be parental or extended family or that hope or loss and what's in your home. So that's it. I know we have not too much time, but questions and answers and some things. And forgive me, my, my chat thing isn't on because I'm jumping around on these things, but go ahead. Yeah, no, awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Ileana, I'm going to let you uh, check. Okay. Thank you, Marcus, for sharing so much of yourself and your perspectives and how you've dealt with this pandemic um, and uh, the racial uh, things that we've gone through uh, over the last few months. Um, but I wanted to give people an, an opportunity to ask questions. You can either unmute yourself or, or put the questions in the chat and um, to ask Marcus some questions um, a little bit more about, you know, how, or even share your, your experiences about how you, you know, built some resilience and during this time and what has been your process as well. I think we want to hear from others as well. So if anybody wants to share or ask questions. I'll say something if no one's going to go. Um, thank you, Marcus, for what you shared. I really appreciated the imagery. That was great. Um, I wondered, you know, going back to what you said about your kind of unplugging from social media, if you're still writing, and if so, are you sharing that because it's so personal and just how that's contributed a little bit to your healing, but also the intrusion that you must feel from giving of yourself that way? Um, so, <laughs> so I had a blockage. Um, I'd written a lot of things and then... I had a season where a lot of my writing stopped, summer of 2015. There was a major breakup five years ago, right? I was known for writing narrative stories and writing a lot of relationship poetry. All of a sudden, all that ended. <laughs> and I was writing about everything else, right? This break from social media um, at the five-year mark allowed me to revisit um, those feelings with a different perspective. Also aided by the book of All About Love with Bell Hooks, uh, <laughs> Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown and some other readings help you unlock some things. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I have been writing things. I've been writing more personal things, which is actually where I feel most comfortable. Um, and it's because of a uh, a point of validation that came early on in my experience. I think I was like 22 or 23 and I shared a very personal poem um, in public and someone came up to me afterwards uh, and thanked me and said, Hey, I'd been going through this secretly. I, you know, didn't talk to anyone about it, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it helped to hear someone share that out loud. So the answer to your second half is, um, yeah, I, I look forward to the opportunity to share some of the personal things that I've written because as a Baldwinite who is a disciple of James Baldwin, I really hold to that belief that if I don't find a way to take some of the joy and pain in life and translate that in a way that can be a guiding compass um, to those who may come with me or after me, then where where do I stamp myself as artist, right? So I, I lean into that challenge and I look forward to it. Great, thank you so much. Angela, you had your hand up. I think Jane, you wanna say something too? Yeah, maybe Angela and then Jane? Cool, thank you. Hi, so I also wanna thank you for coming on. And my question was, was it tempting throughout this time without social media to return? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it was, so the first three days was torture. Because <laughs> it's an addiction. It's a real addiction. You find, you, I found myself just turning my phone over, just rubbing myself with it. <laughs> right? 
nothing to do, nothing to see on it. Um, then the, after the first two weeks, it got easier. After about a month, Angela, I forgot about social media. I never thought that that would occur. After about a month, because I talked to several people on the phone, um, I was in contact with people who hadn't speak to in years or like, hey, just conversations and having deeper, you know, connections. Um, I lost track that I, did, that I depended on that to be such a vital source. I, I gained my faith back in my own personal connection with people, which was scary at first. The fact that I can pick up the phone and call someone and they'll want to talk to me for 15 minutes. I thought, you know, we were just limited to text messages, you know, there's bite size here, bite size here, let's move on. Hey, did you talk to such and such? Yeah, I talked to him, but really it was just a text message. Um, all that disappeared. Uh, I definitely have a depth and connection with friends now um, by, by virtue of me stepping away from social media and the temptation to get back on now is less around ego because that was the other big struggle overcoming was this idea of self-importance. Um, now when I think about re-entering, the only hesitation is the strategy around how I can tie it to the workshop, workshop with the high schoolers I do. Like now when I go back, I'm like, hey, I, I want to I want to highlight the kids that I've been working with over the summer, right? I want to highlight some of the things that we're going into. And that was the other struggle, which is if no one knows I'm doing all these things, how am I even alive? <laughs> right? Listen, I've gone places and gone. I can't believe I didn't take one photo, right? It's a freak out moment. How am I having a special moment without taking a picture? Guess what? Ah, I still had that moment. And I, I'll take a picture out of a water fountain or with an ocean or, but I haven't, I tell you in the last four months, I maybe have taken one selfie. And that was just to show someone that my cat had jumped on my back. Other than that, I haven't seen a photo of myself and it's been such a relief to just look at and think about other people. So the temptation is around what I can do for other people. Nice, very cool. Thank you. Jane, you want to jump in? Maybe another couple of questions that we have time for. Jane? This has been awesome. Um, I have a question about something you said earlier. I don't remember exactly. You said something like, now you feel comfortable, like knowing what you think and what you feel. Um, and then you can move forward knowing what you want to do in the world. Whereas before it was a lot of trying to accept what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for how to get there? to being comfortable and like like how to tap into what you really feel rather than just being like well these are what people are telling me i should feel and they're probably smart um or how did you realize that you'd gotten there um i'm gonna give you a real feeling um reading helps reading helps and i'm gonna tie you into this reading helps because that means that someone besides me and before me wrote about their experiences. So tying that back to the experience, tying that back to the, import, the importance of you at home and your, whatever memory you had and all your senses and all your things, imagine you writing that out and then me reading that and then going, wow, okay, someone's felt that, someone's seen that, someone's experienced that, that gives me more oomph to speak on that. All right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one who thought that this is how things should be, or this is how things should be translated. The person who did that for me specifically, um, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this question. Then I'm going to jump over and cut this light on over me, um, was James Baldwin. Um, I read his book, uh, years ago, the fire next time. And I'll never forget the feeling once I was done with his book the fire next time, I felt like someone had walked in and kicked open a chest, a chest with every weapon and tool in life. And I felt complete, I was like, all these things that I felt were missing, by the time I finished reading that book, every tool and weapon was in that box. And the amazement was, there were things I had been carrying around with me for years in life. It just took reading it with someone else to go, 
you know enough to speak on that, Marcus. You felt enough to speak on the, the pain of loss. You've felt enough to speak on the connection of love. You felt enough to speak on your experience with racism. Now, I'm not casting this out to be the answer or the solution to the world. I'm saying, hey, if I have an experience and you have an experience and we can have a conversation about what those experiences are like in there, we're gonna find some commonality which may lead to a solution for the conflict that we may have with each other or the conflict around us. But the first thing was understanding the validity in my, raise your voice, raise your vibration, the validity in my own voice. And the first thing I had to explore going back to the workshop was, what do I think? What do I feel? And then who else is thinking this? Who else is feeling this? Which comes about through either reading or to Brianna's point, um, sharing and then having someone go, wow, I felt that as well. Um, so then to kind of conclude the answering to your question in terms of the clarity, now that I, I feel a sense of empowerment to my own ideas and thoughts, which I've had for a while, but there's nothing like smart people saying, there's nothing like reading someone smart and going, hey, I thought of that before I even read that book, <laughs> right? To make, to make you go, oh man, I'm on the right track. Um, once those things came into play, it became a strategy about how to share it. Um, I'm thinking about a book uh, workshop or just a sharing technique I want to do around All About Love for Bell Hooks. Um, as a man who really talked uh, horribly <laughs> about uh, Brene Brown and all her philosophies, um, I definitely want to go back in and, and have a connection with other young men who are don't want to deal with fear and shame and feel that we're kind of boxed in in terms of our image that we have to portray to make it through these times. And I say, hey, you know what? I found a way that actually if you go through the fear and shame, you actually come out on a better place rather than blocking it all out. Yeah, insanity. So that's the answer to my question. I know there's another question. Let me cut on this light right above me. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, I, I, do we have another question? Uh, or, or I know we have just a couple minutes left here. Um, just while... Marcus, we have a survey that has put on there. If you could go there and fill it out for us, that'd be great. Um, if you can, that'd, that'd be awesome. If you need to cut and paste it before we end, that's great too. You can do it afterwards. Um, any other, any last question for Marcus before <clears throat> we wrap up? Anybody? Hey, thank you. And thank you all for, for cutting on your cameras. I know it's, sometimes it's tempting to like stay in the shadows, but um yeah as you can see when i start seeing people's faces it's a different it's a different feel mine, right? was, mine wasn't good enough huh <laughs> not anywhere <laughs> close not anywhere close you know what i'm saying i need pigtails i need christmas decorations i need cats in the background i need jellyfish i need yeah. you know ring lights i need different things that make me feel connected to people uh, no i hear you i am i'm kidding uh, uh, Ileana, anything else want to wrap up as we as we close, anything you want to say, Marcus? That that was awesome. Thank you, Matt. really um, powerful and um, you know uh, very very helpful. And just even and thinking about how we can sort of move through a healing process through 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 cut learning to cut through the chaos in many ways um, through this process. So thank you, thank you. I don't Ilya. know if anybody's typed a, a question into the box. Can I jump in there really quickly because I had written down something I wanted to share because um, I am such a uh, well, I'm nowhere close to a bibliophile. Let me stop lying. Um, but just thinking about this workshop, I just want to name out a few books that I've read that uh, helped me out, um, that are worth a read and are worth a reread. Um, these are my own personal things. Um, this is if someone asked me, which no one did. Um, <laughs> what was it that you read? Uh, one for writers is uh, Letters to a Young Poet by Rainier Maria Rilke. Letters to a Young Poet. If you have ever thought about writing anything and wondered, I wonder if I can be a writer. In 122 pages, it'll bust your mind open. The other one, The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Paulo Coelho, right? I avoided this forever. 
I tried to read it and I said, that's some childish nonsense. Get that out of here. I need some higher level thinking, right? Finally got back around to this thing years ago. Bro, listen, amazing. Read and reread. In this time of pandemic, when we're thinking, what's my direction in life? What's my purpose? Where am I going? Where have I been going? The Alchemist, right? Worth a read or a reread. Something I just gifted to a friend of mine the other day, the prophet, Cahill Gibran. Um, Non-religious, but spiritual in terms of just how to deal with different abstract nouns in life. Love, friendship, courage, giving, work. Oh my God. If you want to go through a whole abstract thing, it's in this book. If you've never read this book or don't have it, it's worth picking up to just pull some things from. Um, the other one was All About Love by Bell Hooks. That's a challenging read. Um, it is truly all about love. Um, don't let the fact that she is, and this I, I preface this because I've seen people block it out. They say, oh, it's a black woman. So if I'm not black, then it doesn't matter to me. If I'm not a woman, it doesn't matter to me. Listen, All About Love deals all about love. It's a challenging read. You have things that you believe about love and then she's going to challenge you on it. But it's, to me, it was worth the challenge because I come out to Jane's question. Um, after I isolated things that I agreed and disagreed with, I knew more why I was confident in the things that I agreed and disagreed with. So All About Love helped me with that one. And then, of course, uh, the book I read two or three months ago, um, The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, uh, which again now is the absolute truth. Um, it helped open up a lot of things and it actually changed the way that I teach and interact with people. So those are a few of my long-standing books and a few recent recommendations. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. That's great. I want to close it up by saying thank you to everyone that came. My video kept uh, freezing, so that's why I came. I was not talking as much, but I see. I saw so many uh, young faces. Thank you for being part of this. And I love, Marcus, what you said about sort of stepping back during this moment so the voices of the youth could sort of come forward. And for me, that was really inspirational during these past few months is seeing all of the young people in the protests. And um, I think that we need to see more of that. We need to hear voices. Um, I want to remind everyone, if you want to, sh we need to, we need you to write. We need you to uh, speak up. We need you to just share your story as well. Um, you can go to uh, the chat and there's a, a way that you can fill out the survey and also submit your, your writing. We want to hear from you. And I just want to thank you, Marcus, for taking this moment and Miguel as well to, to, you know, create this space for young people and others to be able to, um, to raise their voice and raise their vibration. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to look for a promise um, because you were my last physical workshop and what a blessing it was. Um, and to come somewhat full circle to this, I would love at some point in time when things relax, that if we can bring it back together, we have, we have to do another workshop and we're going to take from the micro to a full on workshop, get some things created, get some things shared and have everybody enter the world. But yeah, my, my take on what you just said is um, don't let 24 hour news cycle listening to experts or so-and-so on TV, when you cut all that out, you tap into the expert within yourself, which is your own experiences, your own feelings, your own relationship to life. And it may be less of them that someone needs to hear and someone specifically like yourself, Angela, Brianna, or Jane, that someone needs to connect with that story. Yeah. Thank you. You've got it, Marcus. We're gonna bring everyone back together and uh, we want to hear all of everyone's voices and because it gives me hope. The yeah. young generation, the new generation gives me hope for the future. So thank yeah. you all. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Jane quoted you, not even close. I need pigtails. I need Christmas decorations and jellyfish. So you're, you know, she got it right up there for you, Marcus. <laughs> There's the prophet. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, uh, yeah, The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, The Prophet by uh, Khalil Gibran. So, yeah, 
Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Thank you, everybody. There's the alchemist. Yeah, he's putting the books up there. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all and have a good night.